Welcome to Thriller Vault, where thriller writers tell their favorite stories. I'm your host, Phil Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, action-adventure author, Luke Richardson. How are you doing, Luke? I'm very well, thank you, Phil. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. Before we get into the story, I'd like to mention that Luke has a free box set on his website, LukeRichardsonAuthor.com. And I have two free ebooks on my website, philwbooks.com. If you prefer to listen as you are right now, we also have tons of audiobooks. Just search your audiobook retailer for Luke Richardson or Phil M. Williams. I titled this story The Experiment. When I was in college in 1999, I was struggling for money. My parents were going through a divorce, and money was tight. I saw an advertisement to participate in a psychological study. They paid $50 and the study was one to two hours long. So I signed up. I figured, you know, 25 bucks an hour is pretty good. The study took place in the basement of the psychology department. I told the stunning receptionist who I was and she instructed me to wait in the waiting area, which was just a few plastic chairs along the wall. I waited for a few minutes while the receptionist pecked on her keyboard. I couldn't help but steal a few glances at her. Then, a bald man in a white lab coat entered the waiting room. He asked, Phil? I stood from my seat. The researcher introduced himself as Dr. Bass. I was led down a hallway to a small room with no windows. Another study participant stood in the room, a tall, lanky young man with a greasy complexion and acne on his forehead. A small table was set up in the middle of the room with a metal box and an intercom on the table. The metal box had a dial on it with a voltage sign and a button. Wires ran from the box to to a partition booth. I expected Dr. Bass to introduce me to the other guy, but he didn't. What's this study about, I asked. We're testing memory with word pairs, Dr. Bass replied. One of you will be the teacher and one of you will be the learner. Dr. Bass grabbed a coin from his pocket and said, heads or tails? Tails, I replied. Dr. Bass flipped the coin, caught it, glanced at the face, and said, Tails it is. You'll be the teacher. He turned to the tall guy and said, And you'll be the learner. Dr. Bass showed us the inside of the booth. It looked like a recording booth. There was a single chair, an intercom like the one on the table was on the was on the counter. Wires attached to electrodes sat on the counter. Dr. Bass said to the tall guy, As the learner, you'll be in here. I glanced at the lanky young man. He looked scared. Dr. Bass gestured to the seat and said to the tall guy, Have a seat. The tall guy sat, and Dr. Bass strapped him into the seat. As Dr. Bass worked, he explained the experiment. He said, The teacher will read various word pairs. The learner will do his best to remember the word pairs. Then, the teacher will read the words back to the learner, but without the pair. The learner will need to remember the pair. If the learner doesn't remember the pair, the learner will receive a mild shock. The tall guy swallowed hard. I was thankful that I won the coin toss. Dr. Bass finished strapping the tall guy to the chair, and then he shut the learner into the booth. I followed Dr. Bass to the table. Have a seat, Dr. Bass said, pulling out that wooden chair. I sat before the metal box and the intercom. The black dial was pointed to the bottom of the scale, which read 15 volts. The scale went all the way up to 450 volts. 15 volts was labeled slight shock. 300 volts was labeled danger. And 450 volts was labeled with three X's. Dr. Bass removed a wire from his lab coat pocket. He plugged it into the back of the machine and said, I'd like for you to experience the shock. I raised my eyebrows. Don't worry, it's only a slight shock. Dr. Bass hooked an electrode to my finger and pressed the button on the metal box. I winced, surprised by the intensity of the shock. See, just a mild shock, Dr. Bass said as he removed the electrode. Dr. Bass grabbed a clipboard that hung on the wall. He removed the top sheet of paper from the clipboard and set it on the table before me. These are the word pairs. I nodded and scanned the short list. Dr. Bass turned on the intercom and said, Learner, are you ready? Yes, the learner replied, his voice cracking. Dr. Bass gestured to the list. Go ahead and read the pairs to the learner. Speak into the intercom. I read the word pairs. Bad, 
boy, red, dress, young, man, sunny, day. Dr. Bass spoke into the intercom. The teacher will now read the first word of each pair, and you need to recall the pairing, okay? Okay, the learner replied through the intercom. Dr. Bass instructed me to read the first word, then to let the learner answer. I said, bad. The learner replied, boy. I said, red. The learner replied, dress. I said, young. The learner replied, man. I said, sunny. The learner replied, afternoon. I turned in my seat and looked up at Dr. Bass, who stood next to me. I said, he got that one wrong. Dr. Bass said, Let the learner know that was incorrect. Give him the correct answer. Dr. Bass pointed at the metal box. Then, let the learner know the voltage and press the button to administer the shock. I cleared my throat and said, That's incorrect. The correct answer is sunny day. Sunny day. I said it again to make sure that he got it. There's a 15 volt shock. I pressed the button and the learner <clears throat> grunted in response. Dr. Bass gave me another piece of paper, this one featuring the same word pairs, but with two additional word pairs. I read the word pairs to the learner. Then I read the first word, waiting for the pair from the learner. The learner got the original pairs correct, but he missed one of the new ones. It was supposed to be old house, but he said old man. That's incorrect, I said. The correct answer is old house. There's a 15 volt shock. Raise the voltage to 30 volts, Dr. Bass said. I hesitated for a beat. Then I turned the knob to 30 volts. I said, 30 volts. Then I pressed the button. The learner yelped. I read the next set of word pairs. This one with the six previous word pairs and two new ones. I was annoyed that the learner missed red dress, saying red Corvette instead. That was an original word pair, one that he'd gotten right twice before. It's not like I wanted to shock the guy. <laughs> Dr. Bass told me to up the voltage to 60. I asked, are you sure? Please continue, Dr. Bass said. I turned the dial and said, 60 volts. Then I pressed the button, administering the shock. The learner yelped and said, that hurt. I read the next set of word pairs, and the learner made another mistake. I moved the dial to 100 volts per Dr. Bass's instruction. Sweat collected under my arms and at my lower back. I turned to Dr. Bass and said, That's a lot of voltage. Please continue, Dr. Bass said. Are you sure? I asked again. The experiment requires that you continue. So I said, 100 volts, and I pressed the button. The learner <sighs> cried out in pain. I read the next set of word pairs. There were 12 in total now. The learner missed the second one. It was like he wasn't even trying. I felt bad for him, but I was also annoyed that he was forcing me to do this to him. <laughs> Dr. Bass said, 200 volts. I shook my head. Please continue, Dr. Bass said. It's too much voltage, I replied. The experiment requires that you continue, Dr. Bass said. I turned the dial to 200 volts. This isn't a good idea. It's absolutely essential that you continue, Dr. Bass said. I said into the intercom, 200 volts. With a shaky finger, I pressed the button. The learner <laughs> screeched and said, ow. I read the next set of word pairs. The learner was doing better, but he missed one of the new words. Blue sky was the word pair, and the learner said blue water. Dr. Bass said, 300 volts. On the electroshock machine, 300 volts was labeled as danger. I pointed this out to Dr. Bass. He replied, please continue. Even though it says danger, I asked. The experiment requires that you continue, Dr. Bass said. It sounded like the last one hurt, I said. It is absolutely essential that you continue, Dr. Bass said. I turned the dial to 300 volts. I rubbed the back of my neck. My stomach was in knots. I don't know about this, I said. You have no other choice but to continue, Dr. Bass said. So I said, 300 volts and I pressed the button. The learner screamed and said, my heart's beating really fast. I think something's wrong. The learner banged on the booth. Let me out of here. Something's wrong with my heart. I think he needs help, I said. Please continue, Dr. Bass replied. 
The learner banged on the booth again. Let me out! His breathing was ragged. He wants out, I said. Whether the learner likes it or not, you must go on until he has learned all the word pairs correctly. So please go on, Dr. Bass said. I read the next set of word pairs. The learner missed the first one. I wondered if he was fit to remember anything. Dr. Bass said, 400 volts. 400 volts, really? I asked. Please continue, Dr. Bass said. He could get hurt, I said. Dr. Bass replied, although the shocks may be painful, there is no permanent tissue damage, so please go on. What happens if he does get hurt? Who's responsible, I asked. I will take responsibility. Please continue, Dr. Bass replied. I turned the dial and said, 400 volts. I hesitated with my finger on the button for a moment. Then I pressed it quickly, hoping that it would make the shock quicker. The learner cried out in pain and complained about his heart again. As I read the next set of word pairs, I noticed that I no longer heard his ragged breathing. The learner was silent. Is he okay? I asked. Please continue, Dr. Bass said. So I read the rest of the word pairs. Then I read the first single word, which was bad. But the learner didn't reply. I repeated the word, but there was still no reply. 450 volts, Dr. Bass said. You should check on him, I said. Please continue, Dr. Bass replied. I don't think the learner wants to continue, I said. Whether the learner likes it or not, you must go on until he has learned all the word pairs correctly. So please go on, Dr. Bass said. I swallowed hard, my throat dry. I don't think I can continue. The experiment requires that you continue, Dr. Bass said. I really think you should check on him. He could be hurt, I said. Although the shocks may be painful, there is no permanent tissue damage, so please go on, Dr. Bass said. I turned the dial all the way to the right, max voltage. I said, 450 volts. I placed my index finger on the plastic button. My stomach churned. I felt sick to my stomach. But I did what I was told. I pressed the button, but the learner didn't react at all. Dr. Bass handed me the next set of word pairs. I stood from the table. Someone needs to check on him. Please continue, Dr. Bass said. I shook my head. The experiment requires that you continue, Dr. Bass said. I shook my head again. It is absolutely essential that you continue. I stepped back from the table. I can't do this. You have no other choice. You must go on, Dr. Bass said. I glared at Dr. Bass and said, What do you mean I must go on? Are you going to force me? Dr. Bass didn't reply. I pivoted and stepped to the door. I expected the door to be locked, but it wasn't. I expected Dr. Bass to stop me, but he didn't. I sprinted from the basement of the psych building all the way back to my dorm room. I grabbed my phone and dialed 9 and 1. But before I hit that final 1, I thought, I'm at least an accessory to murder. Dr. Bass said he would take responsibility if something happened to the learner, but that wouldn't hold up in court. I hung up the phone. I started to worry that someone might come to my dorm. The police or Dr. Bass? I wasn't sure which was worse. I went to the library. I sat at a window which had a view of the Gothic psych building. I pretended to read, but mostly I watched the psychology building, expecting to see an ambulance or police or maybe Dr. Bass with a rolling suitcase. I imagined the lanky man cut up into pieces and shoved into a hard suitcase. I figured it would take Dr. Bass several trips if he was working alone. I stayed at the library until closing, which was 10 p.m. I never saw any police, EMTs, or Dr. Bass. That night, I tossed and turned, every sound causing me to jolt awake and alert. The next morning, I was exhausted from my 8 a.m. class, Intro to Philosophy. I fell asleep and was kicked out of class by the professor. I walked by the psych building on my way back to my dorm room. Once I got back to my dorm, there was a, there was a message on my machine, the blinking light like the learner's heartbeat. I pressed the button. Dr. Bass's voice caused me to flinch. He said, this is Dr. Bass. Yesterday, you left in quite a hurry. I hope you're well. If you would like to be paid, you must return to my office by the end of the day today. Anger coursed through my veins. 
I was pissed that this creep manipulated me into possibly killing someone, and now he's trying to manipulate me again. I opened my dresser drawer and grabbed the fixed blade knife I kept under my socks. My college was in a bad neighborhood. Several of my friends had been robbed. One of my friends had been held up in the parking lot of a nearby 7-Eleven. He ran from the robber, but was shot in the ankle in the process. I attached the scabbard and knife to my belt, then I covered it with my fleece. I went back to the psych building, still high on anger. Class was in session, so the hallways were mostly empty. I descended the stairs to the basement. It was quiet downstairs. I entered the same waiting room as before. I told the same beautiful receptionist who I was. She told me to wait, and she would call Dr. Bass. I stood, brooding, thinking about the knife hidden under my fleece. The door opened from the back offices. Dr. Bass appeared. He handed an envelope to the receptionist and returned to the back offices without even looking at me. The receptionist approached and handed me the envelope. She said, here you go. I took the envelope. Did you do it? She asked. I snapped to attention. Do what? I asked. Did you go all the way to 450 volts? I was tongue tied. Don't worry about it, she said. Most people do. It's kind of crazy, though. The door to the back offices opened again, and the learner appeared. I stared at the tall, lanky man with acne as he approached. He said to the, he said to the receptionist, I'm going to McDonald's. You want anything? No thanks, Gabe, she replied. I watched Gabe leave, my mouth ajar like he was a ghost. The receptionist laughed and asked, Did you think you killed him? I turned back to the receptionist and said, No, of course not. She smirked and said, You're not the first one to think that. If you ask me, I think you all should get way more than 50 bucks. That's, <laughs> that's I love pretty it. much it. Do you, so do you think this? I love it. Do you it. think the story was uh, true, false, or somewhere in between? I've heard of such experiments before, actually. I've read about such experiments before, so I think that is true. It's somewhere in between. I personally never took this test, but lots of people have. This was actually Stanley Milgram's test to measure obedience to authority figures. Uh, Milgram was studying how many people would administer that fatal shock, that 450-volt shot shock, and how many people would refuse. Uh, the learner, the guy, you know, the acne guy, he was actually part of the experiment and he's an actor in real life. He, like the learner would be uh, the actor. Right. So the results, which really interesting about this experiment is that the results were very, very chilling. So before Stanley Milgram conducted the experiment, he polled something like 40 psych psychiatrists and they believe they thought that most subjects would stop the experiment prior to. Uh, actually, they predicted by the 300 volt shock, they thought only 3.73% of the subjects would still continue. And they believe that, on, that only a little over one tenth of 1% of the subjects would administer that highest 450 volt shock on the board, right? Um, and what they found was that throughout the experiment, the teachers, you know, they would be stressed, just like I had in the story, you know, they showed signs of stress and tension, but two thirds administered that final 450 volt shock. So, and Milgram's experiment, that's, it's been recreated all over the world. Thomas Blass, he, uh, he's from the University of Maryland. He actually did a meta analysis of the experiment. And he found that the percentage of subjects who inflicted the fatal voltages averaged 61% uh, in US studies and 66% in non-US studies. So this is just an absolute sta absolutely staggering to me. Um, he, uh, Milgram actually has a book called, uh, the perils of obedience. And what he wrote in his book, I'll, here, I'll read this quick quote here, which I think is really telling. He wrote, um, the legal and philosophic aspects of obedience are of enormous importance, but they say very little about how most people behave in concrete situations. I set up a simple experiment at Yale university to, to test how much pain, an ordinary citizen would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered to by an experimental scientist. Stark authority was pitted against the subject's strongest moral imperatives against hurting others. And with the subject's ears ringing with the screams of the victims, authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any lengths on the command of an authority constitutes the, sh the chief finding of the study 
and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Ordinary people simply doing their job and without any particular hostility on their part can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Moreover, even when the destructive effects of their work become patently clear and they are asked to carry out actions incompatible with fundamental standards of morality, relatively few people have the resources needed to resist authority. So I think, I think Milgram's study, I just think it's immensely important. Obedience to authority is necessary for war. It's necessary for genocide. Obedience to authority is necessary for government tyranny. Uh, it's necessary for rulers like Mao or Stalin or Pol Pot or Hitler to rule. Uh, today, for example, Americans have this great disdain for Nazis, often evoking their name anytime they view something that is tyrannical from their perspective. This, to me, is very ironic because in many ways, the U.S. population is just as susceptible to authoritarianism as the Germans were. According mm. to Milgram's study, almost two-thirds of Americans will administer a fatal shock simply because someone in authority tells them to do so. These subjects were not forced to deliver the shocks. They were not threatened. Now, I just try to, th I think of it this way. Imagine if that you're a German person during the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party. What are the chances that you would defy the Nazis and risk your life to help you know, somebody like Anne Frank? I mean, the people hmm. who hid Jews and they were in the tiny, these people were, were just in the tiny, tiny minority of just people that were, that place morality above even their own life, even their own family's life. They risk their lives and the lives of their families. And I think statistically speaking, most of us would have been Nazis. Most of us would have gone along with all the stuff that happened. And, and if you think about it, there are, there are many governments throughout the world that are doing evil things all over the world. And there are citizens that are going along with it right now. And I don't think that those people are any different than you and I. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he talked about, I, I forget the exact quote, but he talked about every person having their heart, you could cut a, cut their heart in half and one half would be good and one half would be evil. And, um, and I think it's true. I think we, we, we all have that capability of evil and we all have the capability of good. And, um, and unfortunately the authority aspect has been used for a lot of evil. And I think that, um, I think that's something that people need to be aware of is, is how they're influenced by authority figures. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because you're right that that person becomes the authority figure, Dr. Bass, in your in your case. Right. And and so you go along yeah. with, with the thing. What, one question I had or one thought I had is I wonder I wonder what the demographic of the of the of the participants were because of course students you know 19 20 21 year olds would see dr bass as a as a as a authority figure but how right. would that be if he did it with they, 40 they... 50 year olds 60 year olds who weren't students or, or people who were his peers you know i i wonder how that authority plays out because you clearly see that authority well, it's also well, they... in a, it's also in an academic setting so that's a point as well they they're going into his environment where he is the professor you know so so you're you're right. building that level of authority in in the setting as well so i wonder how that would change in a, in a different place if you watch the old video of it like you'll see a guy like getting really upset he's an old guy he's oh an right. old guy with yeah. white hair uh and, and so they huh. so i don't know what the exact demographics are but i know they didn't only use students because there's video of this guy and i know that the meta analysis of the story of the situation but I, I it is an interesting thing you would think that younger people would be more apt to um listen to authority but i don't know that that's necessarily true i actually in my book the mm. propaganda project i actually ran a survey and the survey was designed to see how much people's morality changed when they were dealing with the exact same instance when when it was the state versus the versus an individual and what i found was that older people actually changed their morality more for the state, meaning that they were a little bit more propagandized than younger people, which is, which goes in the face of what, what, what the yes. common thought would be like, well, a younger person is going to be more respectful of authority. I'm not hundred percent sure that's true or not, but that is but a really interesting. I suppose we've seen question. quite a lot of the protests, like the anti-war movements in the last 
um, in the last 50 yeah. years and such have been younger generations, haven't they? Who've, who, who perhaps right. weren't there. In, yeah. They've been younger people. Jury, they haven't seen war in the same way. So they've been a lot, uh, perhaps had different opinions of it. Right. And I think it's also time and duration. Like an older person has been subjected to propaganda for longer in their life, you know? Yeah. And, and um, I suppose quite often they're so more I, comfortable I, I, so, as well. You know, if you're sure. you've got more to risk, if you're in your 60s and you've got yeah, you've got a nice house and you live in a nice place and you've got, you know, you, you don't want to mess things up too much, do you? But if you're in your 20s and you, right. you, you you haven't yet really established yourself, actually, it doesn't matter to you what it doesn't and not that it doesn't matter to you. It's you've got you've got more to more to live for, I suppose, more to play for, more, more reason to, to, to make a change at that stage in your life. Yeah, I think that's 100% true. They, you know, they also did variations of the study where the guy, the, la the Dr. Bass, you know, the Dr. Bass character left mm. and then another guy without a lab coat took his place. And that dramatically huh. dropped the, uh, the, you know, the people who complied. So people were much less to comply when there was somebody without the coat that gave that <laughs> sort of air of authority. And uh, another thing that they, they found too is that they gave they instead of the purse having the person directly administer the shocks, they they had um, the person be kind of like the researcher standing there telling them to administer the shocks. Mm -hmm. And and what they found was that if you didn't actually have to push the button yourself, that that the compliance went higher. So they were much more likely to, to shock all the way to four hundred fifty volts if they didn't have to push that button themselves. So if you think about like the bureaucracies of government and the military and all this stuff, the people at the top, I mean, it can get to be very cold and you lose the humanity of, of mm -hmm. the people because they become people, they become, you know, pieces on a chessboard, uh, you know, uh, just a statistic. And, um, and another variation was they actually had to touch the people and hardly anybody complied when they when they had physical contact and not not having a booth to separate them interesting story uh, interesting thing to be thinking about in in our books isn't it even if that's a theme uh, a minor theme or some kind of theme it's an interesting idea to play with and i suppose that's the yeah. beauty of being a writer if, if, isn't it if you, you can want... play with di these ideas right i mean if you want to write some a uh, character that uh, gets 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 your character to do something really bad you know, you know that it's 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 not unrealistic to have an authority figure to make not you don't even have to necessarily make them. You can, you know, use strong word commands and say you need to do this. And, you know, if, if you have authority, you can get them to do it. So anyway, so thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching Thriller Vault. If you like this story, please like, comment and subscribe. I hope you all come back next week. Thanks so much. See you again.